Thank you, Beata, and your colleagues. Uh, Madam Bachmann, ladies and gentlemen, friends. It's indeed a great honor to receive the Corey Christensen uh, Award, um, and I'm very excited about this event. This uh, will go to our headquarters in Los Angeles and will be greatly honored. I'm speaking on behalf of an organization that has over 400,000 members around the world, many of whom are Christian Zionists. And I am certain, because I uh, worked for almost 20 years until his death with Simon, that probably Kore Christiansen and Simon Wiesenthal would have been great friends. I uh, think that uh, both of them, from what I heard, shared a good sense of humor. And so I would like to perhaps start with a relevant joke. Uh, it's about the Israeli father who is taking his son for his bar mitzvah uh, on a trip across Europe. And he explains to him before they leave that uh, most of the people that he'll see, they're not Jewish, they're Gentile. When they get to the uh, Parthenon, the Acropolis in Athens, the child asks his father, Abba, are these people Jewish? And he says, no, I told you, uh, most of the people here are Gentile. Uh, the same thing happened at the Colosseum in Rome and then eventually at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. The boy looks at his father and he says, Abba, I think I can now understand. And I feel so sorry for these Gentiles. They are dispersed all over the world. <laughs> so everything is a matter of perspective and we are quite happy that our Gentile friends are dispersed all over the world and growing in many continents, because we need you. We need you desperately. And in the same way, we are deeply concerned with the future and the fate of Christians in the Middle East and beyond. And we are there for them. Our approach to our work is taken from the uh, Passover Sedo. And that is that the Lord took us out of Egypt with a clenched fist, Yad Chazaka, and a, an outstretched arm, Zoranatuya. And this is what diplomats, my wife is a diplomat, they, uh, they would call this the carrot and the stick. So, Simon would often say what starts with the Jews never ends with them. It becomes a uh, scourge for general society. And based in France, we are extremely sensitive to what might be called anti-Semitic terrorism. I would like to just tell you a personal story. We came to Paris in October, in, uh, in 1980. And in October, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, the, uh, I was visiting a well-known journalist in the center of Paris. She had a house guest for the weekend. She'd just come in from Israel. Her name was Elisa Chagrio. Her husband was a well-known filmmaker in Israel. And she uh, said to the hostess, do you need anything for dinner? And Tamar said, maybe a few dates or figs. I went down in the lift together with Elisa, and uh, I continued straight towards my car. She turned into the Rue Copernic where she met her death. I didn't hear the bomb, I felt the bomb. It was the synagogue of the Rue Copernic and the fruit shop was immediately opposite. The following morning, the Prime Minister of France, Raymond Bau, said a most unfelicitous thing. He said that a bomb set for Jews killed four innocent Frenchmen. Well, one was a Chinese waiter in the restaurant uh, opposite, the second was a Portuguese delivery boy on a uh, scooter. The third was a Lisa, and the fourth was an innocent Frenchman. And Giscard d'Estaing, four months later, said, I lost my election in Copernic as a result of that. But Copernic was the first in two years of terrorist attacks, shootings and bombings of Jewish targets. It uh, ended in August of 1982. 
with the so-called massacre of Joe Goldenberg's restaurant. Now, the question is, why did it stop? Israel, in August of 1982, led an incursion into southern Lebanon in order to break up PLO camps where Western European terrorists were being trained. Those terrorists immediately fled. They came back home. They forgot Jews. They needed money. They attacked banks and uh, uh, um, military uh, NATO bases and embassies. As a result, the governments cracked down. And we heard no more from Bader Meinhof in Germany, Action Direct in France, or the Red Brigades in Italy. Yes, Simon was right. What starts with the Jews never ends with them. So, I, uh, excuse me. Yeah, okay. Since then, we've come to a new stage in anti-Semitic terror. It is a stage where not imported terrorists, as in the 1980s, but native-born Islamists raised in uh, slum belts around Paris and other cities, and other cities not only in France. And they have transplanted from the Middle East a conflict where they play not cowboys and Indians, but they play um, Palestinians and Israelis. And who are the Israelis? They are the, the neighboring Jews wherever they are. And this situation is something which has grown and is now festering, and it's become a pathological ep epidemic. We in the Wisdom Center, we don't believe just in protest. We will only ha intervene where we think that we can change the situation. And as such, we uh, are particularly concerned with the narrative of Christians and of Jews. Now, if somebody could tell me how to turn this on, uh, is that going to work? No? Ah. Okay, so this is a PowerPoint just to give you some idea as to uh, the theft of Jewish identity, the ultimate anti Semitism, but with it goes Christian identity. So it doesn't. Ah, okay. I'm going to talk about UNESCO, where my wife has been for the last 23 years and is uh, now uh, reaping uh, the lightning and thunder against uh, herself since Israel has left and so has the United States. The role of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee is to protect and preserve sites of universal value. And back in the year 2000, uh, you may remember, some of you, that um, the mayor of Osvensim, which is the town of Auschwitz, opened a discotheque in the protected zone. I went to Warsaw, spoke with the ministers, nothing doing. They sent me to the uh, governor, still nothing doing. I went to uh, Osvensim, and the mayor said, we have the right to a discotheque. Yeah, you have the right to the discotheque, a dozen of them, but not there. That was in the tannery where the hair was cut. He refused to do anything. We turned to the uh, Heritage Committee, which I thought was meeting in Brussels, but it was meeting in Cairns, Australia. Got on a plane, went down to uh, Sydney, from there to Cairns. There, the chairman of the session was the Finnish ambassador, and I said, look, I have three minutes as an NGO, which is assistant partner of UNESCO. And he said, OK, but it better be good. And I said, well, uh, when I started to speak, I said, I come from the hell of Auschwitz to the paradise of the Barrier Reef to tell you of the Auschwitz discotheque. And the chairman stopped me, and he said, those two words in correlation, Auschwitz discotheque, are just too much. Mr. Polish ambassador, we're not asking you, we're telling you, close it. And I had to get back to London for an important meeting. Uh, I got back 25 hours later, and it was closed. So we saw that the World Heritage Committee had power. And that was extremely important. So what happened later? Well, the German strategist, Karl von Clausewitz, claimed that war is diplomacy by other means. But since Palestine entered UNESCO with a voracious appetite in November 2011, it's a battlefield. On grounds of emergency, Palestine has annually received Christian and Jewish sites as their heritage. 2012. 
Uh, they didn't have the right to ask for a heritage site for 14 months, but if it was an emergency, as they claimed it was, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Bethlehem and the Pilgrim Root, they said it's been the, it's, the Root has been leaking. And the advisory body to UNESCO, ICOMOS, said, yeah, it's been leaking for 70 years. Where's the emergency? But they got it by a stratagem. 2013 in Phnom Penh, Batil, uh, Judaism and Christianity through the Bible, Beitar headquarters for Bar Kokhba's revolt against the Romans became Palestinian. 2014, the UNESCO Executive Board first uh, uh, gave it, but it was acknowledged that's Rachel's tomb in Bethlehem, on the way to Bethlehem, as a mosque. Then came in Kiev, the question of Hebron and the tomb of the patriarchs. And all of you know who is buried there. Well, I won't give the list. But I was supposed to speak. This is, was in, uh, in Krakow. Um, in, in, no, yeah, Krakow. And uh, it was very difficult because I knew that I was standing. You can see there uh, the, uh, on the side. I was, I was sitting next to a man, I won't call him a gentleman, next to me who was the mayor of Hebron years before, and who I received a little piece of paper in my hand. He had personally shot, killed, six yeshiva boys uh, in the cave. He was sent to jail in Israel, and uh, he was exchanged in the 1,097 that were given for one life, and that is Gilad Shalit. Uh, and so I tore up my script and I said, look, uh, you, this man was invited here. He has blood on his hands, which means that UNESCO has blood on its hands, etc." cetera. Uh, the following year in Manama, which is Bahrain, they were supposed to ask for the Qumran caves and the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is in the spirit of uh, Jesus being proclaimed the, as a Palestinian. Well, it didn't happen because suddenly there was a, uh, an attempt to depoliticize. But rather than depoliticize, it was the strongest resolution on Jerusalem ever and Jewish heritage sites as a war of attrition, increasingly more hostile to Israel. What is the objective of ID theft in the Holy Land? Palestine does not have its own history. It, it seeks to validation through the theft of Jewish and Christian narratives. And supersessionism is a historical imperative. So that so many people have been deleted from geography and history. In the case of the Jewish people, especially after the Holocaust, delegitimization is a step towards annihilation. Now, what happened was there was uh, an argument, and it suddenly the new director general said, we are going to depoliticize. And she came up with the idea of keeping the violently anti-Israel document, but placing it into a square form of black lines, in blocking it like in a box, and saying, this is an annex. Well, if you go and buy a house or you take rent uh, an apartment, uh, usually the annex is considered to be part and partial of the document. Any lawyer will tell you that. So what happened is that when finally the document was accepted because the foreign office in Israel was already beginning to consider departure, so you'll see what happened. The whole document was called an annex. This was um, the program of occupied Palestine. The next one was on uh, the Golan Heights and Israel as a crime against education in the territories. Well, you can see again, the whole thing is an annex. Now, we have produced a, 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 an exhibition which is called People Book Land. It's, a, it's the Jewish trinity, take it out. People book or land, falls apart. So it's the 3,500 year relationship of uh, the Jewish people with the Holy Land. We wanted it to be the state of Israel, the land of Israel. They wouldn't have that in UNESCO. So the rabbis told me, well, Eretz HaKodesh. Holy Land, it's fine, we went along with it. So what happened? Palestinians came out with the book, not 3,500 years, 4,000 years of history. <laughs> look at the book and look at the last chapters on the Palestine mandate. He talks about Palestine Airways, created by Jews, 
run by Jews. Palestine Broadcasting ser uh, Service, run by Jews. Anybody who was a Palestinian in that period was Jewish. So, let's go beyond it. We uh, monitor book fairs. Very low tech, but it's important. In the uh, um, Frankfurt Book Fair, I found this on the Lebanese stand, but it was actually uh, uh, Hamas. It's called the Burak Wall. The Burak Wall, as you can see, I don't know if you can see, but you can just read what it says. The Burak Wall is where, um, according to a Muslim a tradition, Muhammad f took his horse Burak, which was a winged horse, flew from Mecca to Jerusalem, Al-Quds, the holy, went up to heaven, spent the night in heaven, uh, came down, he had attached the horse to a wall, and then flew back to uh, Mecca. There were no direct flights in those days. You had to go through Jerusalem. So if this is true, then the holiest site for Judaism, the Western Wall, is in fact Palestinian. And that's very clever, because if you look at it on the ground, there is the, the Holy Basin. And from the wall, there is the Maghrebi Mount. And you, there you find yourself on the Temple Esplanade. But there is no temple. The temple is called Haram al-Sharif, which means the noble sanctuary with the mosques. Under those circumstances, any non-Muslim who approaches the Kotel, the Western Wall, is in fact trespassing. And that was the objective of this UNESCO agreement. So, the Burak Wall. Now, when we monitor these fairs, and each year we monitor six Arab fairs, Abu Dhabi, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Casablanca, Cairo, Sharjah, and we take pictures. And as you can see, there are hundreds and hundreds of anti-Semitic books. And we stopped this with the Turks, because the Turks were going to be the honored guest of the Frankfurt Book Fair, and they wanted to clean up. So what the Turks, uh, they used to have, uh, from their 33 stands, most of the stands had anti-Semitic literature. What I do is, I go to the Frankfurt Book Fair, I have an agreement with Jürgen Bus, who is the director, and I go from stand to stand, uh, and I, where I see a bad book, I put it up next to the number, and the name of the publisher, I take a picture, I send it that night to him. The following morning, police, two policemen arrive and they go from stand to stand and they confiscate the books to look, to check whether they have indeed violated, not a question of freedom of expression, it violates the uh, contract of the publisher with the book fair. I come the following morning with a journalist and we go around and we look and the book is there where I left it. And so I say to uh, the, the stand holder, Kunt Shorti Hum, in Arabic, and he said, has the policeman been here? And he says to me, yes. I said, but um, the book's there. And he opens the curtain, he says, I've got a hundred. So the thing is that this is important, why? Because we see imams coming to uh, uh, the book fair with their mudaras, their uh, Quranic school students, and they get turned on. More than that, I gave a presentation like this at the European Parliament, and uh, this was some years ago, David Cameron was still the uh, Prime Minister. Uh, one of the MEPs was his closest friend, and he provided to David Cameron the fact that these books were no longer just in, uh, in Arabic, but they were also uh, coming out in French, in uh, English, in German, in Spanish, and they would go first to Muslim schools in countries of those languages, and then from there into high-density Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim-occupied schools in, uh, for the general public. So what we do beyond this, David Cameron, two weeks later, and I watched him on television, he saw that, he said, we've learned this from the Wiesenthal Center, and as far as we're concerned, we are going to block any one of these books arriving in any school. So good for him. Now, what we do is we give a Worst Offender Award each year. And believe me, there are states that are in competition for this award. Last year, it went to Iran. Not for anti-Semitism. It was because of the books for children between the ages of four and seven extolling shahada, martyrdom. 
uh, and runner up was Egypt. So this is the way we go, and you can just see Riyadh and Muscat, Doha, uh, Casablanca, and Cairo, um, and the Frankfurt Book Fest. Okay? So now, uh, I'd just like, like to make a few words about our exhibition. This exhibition has now been shown, uh, and it's generally in parliaments. The idea in parliaments is because it's in parliaments where the recognition of Palestine begins. And uh, it's been very successful, despite the fact that for two years we were blocked by UNESCO. Uh, I don't know if any of you know the name Robert Wistwich, rest in peace. He was the, the author of this. Uh, among the, uh, um, uh, the uh, committee, the honorary committee, we have Elie Wiesel, rest in peace. Uh, we have um, a number of celebrities. I don't know if you know the name Boalem Samsal. If not, you should, really should read the book, uh, The German Shepherd, which is a wonderful book. He's an Algerian Muslim who is a very good friend of Israel. He, uh, his closest friend is David Grossman, the writer in Israel. Uh, so, just, uh, I'm, I'm almost going to uh, finish, but there are some other important stories that I'd like to give you. Um, we have also a program which is almost unique, and that is both in Latin America and now beginning in Europe. It's called the 11 Points Campaign Against Racism in Sports, particularly uh, uh, football. And in uh, Latin America, football is a religion. There was even a war between uh, um, Salvador and Honduras. It was called the football war. So this we now do together with the Organization of American States, a 35-member uh, state organization. Uh, we're now working with them on something in Venezuela, which I can't go into at the moment, but you may read about it. Uh, in Europe, we're doing it through ECAO, European Coalition of Cities Against Racism, and uh, they have 158 city members, and we uh, also, this is affiliated to UNESCO, so though Israel has left and they left a vacuum, we feel that these are now Jewish issues, they are Christian issues, and we have to fill that vacuum. Uh, we also have, when we talk about football, FIFA. Uh, Palestine tried to get uh, Israel thrown out of FIFA, which is the International Federation of Football Associations. Uh, we uh, managed to stop that and, uh, in fact, turned it around because Palestine names its tournaments and its uh, stadia uh, and teams after uh, uh, terrorists. And we were lucky with this. We needed help. And I have to tell you that the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem through the telephone, arranged uh, a group of uh, Swiss, mainly ladies, uh, uh, Christians, uh, who were the branch of the International Christian Embassy. And uh, suddenly the line protecting us from 400 uh, pro-Palestinian uh, agitators uh, cracked. The police uh, couldn't hold them back. And uh, this lady, one of those ladies who on her chain, she had a, a little Star of David and a little cross, she was arrested and charged with provocation. Um, however, the FIFA is an area where we bring uh, examples of best practices. For example, in Argentina, when uh, there was uh, a lot of screams and monkey grunts uh, from a, a football team, uh, there uh, we got the uh, football tribunal to knock down the points that they had made during the year, which brought them from the first division down to the fourth division. Uh, that is now adopted by uh, FIFA as a best practice. So we're making our contributions on very different fronts. We also, Simon Wiesenthal uh, wrote a book. It was called uh, Every Day a Commemoration Day. It's a very, very sad book. So we decided to counter that by a very happy book. And it's called Multi-Faith Calendar, Every Day a Celebration Day. And from January 1 until 3rd, December 31, every day there is some religion, and this is really for Europeans, some religion that, that is practicing. Not to uh, behave like uh, my secretaries when they see this calendar, they believe that every day is, a, is indeed a holiday, but um, 
uh, this we send to mayors, to unions, to the police, to the military, uh, just to give them some idea of what's going on for uh, some of their uh, constituency. Um, finally, to conclude, uh, some five years ago, I was invited for the first time to Iraqi Kurdistan. And in those days, Erbil, the capital, was a center of refuge. It was a wonderful city. Uh, it was finally attacked uh, by Daesh or ISIS. But I was invited to Halabja. Halabja was the town which Saddam Hussein had used gas to kill 5,000 people and wound 27,000 in one day. And I had to speak to some 7,600 of the uh, survivors. And I was looking at them and looking across the water, the straits, at Iran, which is bent upon genocidal intent. And I thought to myself, what do I tell these people? And I said, this is not my first time here. I was here 2,000 years ago when we wrote a book. And the book was called the Talmud. And the Talmud has in it a certain, and I'm sure some of you must know it, and that is, if I am not for myself, who will be? And if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Well, it was this when I said, we are here for you. Of the people sitting in that hall, Congress hall, in Halabja, 25 years ago, after the gassing, and gas is very meaningful uh, for us, poison gas, they had 5% in invalidity if they survived. Today, they have 95% invalidity in their eyes and in their lungs. And our work, not us, but others, took them, it led on to many of them being taken to um, St. Joseph's Hospital, uh, no, Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia for treatment. And what I said, I didn't know it at the time, but it went around the Arab world on television because it was recorded. And this was a very important message for us to make. And the message that we have to make is that what is gas concerns us. What is ill will, what is immoral, what is deadly, as concerns us, Jews and Christians. And today we believe that what we call righteous Gentiles, those people that that kid asked his father, suggested that they are dispersed all over the world. There are today righteous Gentiles, not just those of the, of the Shoah, the Holocaust. And those righteous Gentiles have to be honored. So each year, we take someone to our Hollywood dinner who has done something remarkable. And as I was telling some of us here at dinner, La Sana Patili. Some of you may remember the attack on the kosher supermarket in Paris. Upstairs, there was a young Muslim from Mali shooting people. He killed four people. Downstairs, there was another Malian Muslim. He opened the fridge in this supermarket and he put 15 shoppers there. He closed it, turned off the electricity, thereby saved their lives. When we took him to Los Angeles, we took him to the French Lycée School. And he was asked by African French kids, so, Lasana, how does it feel to be French? Because we got him a French passport. And he said, I've been French for a week because of the Wiesenthal Center. But I'm a Malian Muslim. And they said to him, would you do it again? He said, I don't know. But that's the Islam my mother taught me. And I think that that in itself is the message. Righteous Gentiles. And when it comes to Auschwitz, and when it comes to the memory of the Holocaust, Auschwitz must serve us as a lesson and not a precedent. Thank you.